This clinic is about modeling a sugarcane railroad. And the reasons that sugarcane railroads fascinate me is because they exist mostly in tropical or semi-tropical countries. I've never thought about modeling the tropics and the narrow gauge trains with the variety of engines and rolling stock that ran through these jungles. I've never modeled plantations, funky rolling stock, fancy stucco building, and huge grinding mills. It all interests me, so I thought it might be fun to try modeling it. And for you operators in the audience, sugarcane railroads had routes, timetables, and schedules, just like the bigger mainline railroads. A little background about sugarcane. Here in the USA, cane is still grown in Florida, Louisiana, Texas, and Hawaii. Although most of the larger plantations here have switched to growing sugar beets. The reason is that beets can tolerate much cooler weather and can be mechanically planted and harvested. So it's cheaper to produce sugar beets than it is to grow sugar cane. But in most of the rest of the world, sugar cane is still the world's largest cash crop. It's grown and harvested in more than 90 countries with a worldwide harvest of a billion and a half tons annually. Brazil is the largest producer of sugarcane in the world. The next five major producers are India, China, Thailand, Pakistan, and Mexico, all semi-tropical countries. Other than sugar, there are many other products derived from sugarcane, including rum and molasses, several kinds of alcoholic drinks, and bagasse. Bagasse is the uh, leftover cane after it's been crushed and all of the juice has been removed. Bagasse is used as an insulation material, it's used as a garden mulch, and uh, as cattle feed. Sugar cane is still extensively grown in the Caribbean. Christopher Columbus brought it to the Americas during his second voyage. He first brought it to the island of Haiti in Dominican Republic. It's still usually planted by hand, and a field with good soil and the right climate can produce cane for up to 10 years. Sugarcane is still harvested by hand, and it goes like this. The field is first burnt. The fire burns dry leaves and chases or kills any lurking venomous snakes, all without harming the cane stalks. Harvesters then cut the cane just above ground level using machetes. A skilled harvester can cut over a thousand pounds of sugarcane per hour. My favorite sugar producing country is Cuba. Sugarcane was the biggest crop in Cuba from about 1880 to 1995. At one time there were more than 400 steam engines serving the numerous sugar plantations in Cuba. Nowadays only one or two of these plantations are still in operation serving the needs of the Cuban people. The 1991 collapse of the Soviet Union forced the closure of most of Cuba's sugar industry. The export ended when the Berlin Wall came down and Russia stopped brokering Cuban sugar. The largest sugarcane railroad in Cuba was the Rafael Freire. Sounds like my name, only it's spelled a little differently. And I'm going to let Adolf Hungrywolf introduce Rafael Freire. In the 1990s, the island of Cuba had the world's largest operating fleet of surviving American steam locomotives. Some 300 engines of many types, ages, and builders dating back to 1878. The long standing embargo against Cuba also forced the country to rely on a motley collection of international diesel locomotives painted in various colors, plus rail buses and the famous Hershey Electric Line with its Brill Interurbans and GE steeple cabs. Much has changed on Cuba's many railroad lines since the 1990s. Steam no longer operates in regular service. Several engines in these scenes have been scrapped, but all the rare and historic ones are being preserved, some for charter operations. Our opening footage shows Cuba's most popular railway, the two and a half foot gauge Central Rafael Freire, with one of its Baldwin 280s and a sugarcane train from surrounding hills and mountains. It's early February in 1999, End of the century, though from this scene it's hard to tell which century. Around 1912, American capital built Central Santa Lucia, 
which is now known as Central Rafael Freire. A lot of things there haven't changed much since then. I'm Adolf Hungry Wolf, and we're at La Caridad de Bariay, one of numerous peasant communities located along the 60 kilometers of two and a half foot gauge track that's known as Central Rafael Freire. For several years, this has been my favorite location in all of Cuba. Well, I've chosen the Rafael Freire to model. First, because it was one of the largest sugarcane railroads in Cuba. And second, because through the years, it used an awful motley assortment of engines, cars, and other rolling stock. This is right up my alley, because not only do I have a lot of HON30 rolling stock and cars that would fit this railroad, I also have a lot of ON30 cars. So what I did, I built a small railroad in HON30, and some of you may have seen the episodes on the rail channel. I still have one more episode to go, but I used HON30 to test out all of the scenery things that I had to do, like modeling palm trees and modeling the jungle. What proved to be the hardest thing to model was the sugarcane itself. I experimented both in HO and in O gauge to get the cane to look the way that it looked in the pictures. After a lot of experimentation, I devised a system for building cane in HO scale that pleased me. It's not an original idea. I stole the idea from Hal Reynolds, who stole it from Dave Ravella. So good ideas get around, and here's how I made the sugar cane. This is a piece of a video that I made last year, and it was presented first on the rail channel. In order to make models of sugarcane plants, it's probably a good idea that we should look at the prototype and see how the plant is constructed. From a distance, it looks like tall grass, but as you get closer to it, you can actually see the cane structure in the individual stalks. And you'll notice at the base there are brown leaves, and I noticed that as I started to build my model, I didn't have enough brown in the model, and I'm going to go back and touch that up. This was my first experiment building sugarcane, and I only built a little piece just to see if I could do it. What I'm using here is sisal rope, and I'll explain more about that as we go. The rope I'm using is called sisal rope, and it's available in hardware stores and at Home Depot. Well, after looking at photographs, I determined that the height of the sugarcane plants should be, in HO scale, about 6 to 8, perhaps even 10 feet high. So what I've done, I've cut the sisal rope into pieces, and then I'm pulling the strands apart to separate the fibers. The fibers are very stiff, and they're easy to work with, so they're easy to pull apart. After I separate them, I'm laying them beside this piece of soft iron wire. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to lay these fibers onto the wire and then I'm going to twist it like I was making a pine tree. To hold the fibers in place, I'm using Beacon's 3-in-1 adhesive. I really like the, to use this adhesive because it has some tack to it. It dries clear and it dries fairly flexible. And it's available at Scenic Express and in most Ace hardware stores. So now I'm taking a pallet knife and picking up the fibers that I've separated. And you notice I've separated them so I know I have enough to cover the wire. And I'm going to lay them into the glue using the pallet knife. You could use a spatula from the kitchen for this. And I'm laying them in and I have to spread them out. I had them the length of the wire and they've got compacted a little bit but that's okay. What I'm going to do, I'm going to pick out a few more strands and just lay them in place on the glue. Once I have all the strands in place, then I'll put the top wire on and I'll add the Micromark twisting tool. Once I've attached the tool, I'm going to give the two wires a couple of twists just so that all the fibers will stay in place. Now I'm taking the little uh, vise 
and that's on the end of the wire and putting it in a larger vise just to hold it while I twist them. And to twist the wire all you do is pull on the handle of the tool and it acts like an old-fashioned uh, drill. It just spins the wires around and you can see me doing it here. You can also see underneath some of the other fibers that I've tried and also at the back of the workbench there's fibers there also. <laughs> I've tried all kinds of stuff to get the look that I want for the sugarcane. It's very hard to duplicate the sugarcane foliage. So now the next step is to remove the wires from the vices and with my fingers I'm going to push all of the fibers to one side of the wire. So what I'm doing I'm just taking all of the fibers and bending them upward and Initially, they don't want to stay upward. They want to go back into the shape they were, but we're going to fix that in the next step. I was thinking of using an iron and ironing the fibers upward, but then I tried a heat gun and I had some weights. So what I did, I heated up the fibers and got them so they were almost to the smoking point and then put a weight on them to hold them in place and allow them to cool. And it worked. It ironed them, so to speak, so that they hold their shape and they stay in an upright position. So I left the sugar cane under the weights for about 15 or 20 minutes. And you can tell just by feeling it, because the fiber is, is cooled off now. And it's ready for the next step, which is trimming it. And I got these old carpet shears, and I'm trimming off all of the fibers that look like they're out of place, the ones especially that are coming out of the bottom of the wire, and the ones on top I want to trim so that they look kind of uniform, but I also want to make them look a little bit ragged too, so I'm trimming them down so they're all the same height, and then I'm going to take the scissors and go back and kind of chop at the middle of them a little bit just to give them a, a little ragged appearance, so all the stuff on the workbench I'm saving. Now I'm at the spray booth and I'm spraying the whole sugarcane branch or frond or whatever you want to call it. I'm spraying it with a Design Master Green, which is called Basil. This is the Design Master color. I chose Basil for the sugarcane, but you can buy in AC Moore a whole variety of different shades of green that are made by Design Master. I'm doing both sides. And then the last step is to take some yellow and just run it over the very very top of the frond just to make the color at the top look like the top has died back. I've only ever been in a sugarcane field once and that was on St. Kitts many years ago and I was impressed by the evenness of the rows of the sugarcane plants. They look like they were laid out with geometric precision. So what I'm doing here I'm putting down row upon row of white glue and then putting the frond that I've created into the glue. And in some places you have to bend them so they'll sit flat in the glue. And in several places I added little weights on the ends to actually hold the frond in place. I've decided to make this field look like half of it has been cut already. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put in this last frond, add a couple of weights to the end of it to hold it flat. This one didn't want to sit real flat in there. And then in front of this last row I'm going to add a lot of debris on the ground to look like the slash that's left over when they cut the cane. And you can see here how nice this fiber looks painted up. Here's an old postcard showing the debris on the ground in front of the areas where the cane is being cut. I wanted to duplicate this, but I didn't know quite what to do. So here's the approach I took. I soaked the ground area in front of the cane plants with dilute matte medium. Then I took the Knock Grass Master, and using a green and brown static grass, I proceeded to cover the area with a fine layer of grass. The next step, while the matte medium was still wet, was to take some knock wild grass and this is the same fiber that I'm using in the Grassmaster 
I'm going to take some with my fingers and sprinkle it along the base of the sugarcane plants to look like dead growth. I'm going to have to paint the base a little bit to get the color I want, but this is a start, sprinkling the wild grass into the area, into the wet mat medium in front of the sugarcane plants. Then I wanted to add the look of some cane plants actually laying on the ground. So I took some Woodland Scenics green field grass, took it in my fingers, spread it out, and then with my carpet shears I snipped it so that the pieces fell in kind of a random manner into the wet mat medium. After everything is in place, I'm going to give it all another spray with the mat medium so that we have glue on top and glue on the bottom to hold everything in place. The last step is to get all of the pieces that are sticking up straight to lay flat on the ground to look like they've been trampled. Getting the color of the cane correct was a real challenge for me. You'll notice in the photo that the bottom of the cane is a light and dark brown color and some of the tops of the cane show where they've died back a little. To try and duplicate these colors I started with some craft store acrylic paints. Here's one of the kinds I use. These are very cheap. They're available in craft stores. They're about 59 cents for a little container. I started with this light brown color and I'm just dabbing it onto the base of the plants. And what I'm doing, I'm just using the side of my brush to add the color to the tops of the static grass and the tops of the textures that I've already glued in place. I put the static grass in so that it would look like stubble on the ground, stubble of the plants where they'd been cut. But by taking the paint and pushing it onto the tops of this stubble, I'm knocking a lot of it over and I really don't care about that because this stuff would have been walked on and trampled down by the ox cats and the workers in the fields. After I applied the light brown color, I decided that the color needed to be darker so I selected a little darker brown and I'm brushing it in here to the base of the cane plants and putting it more or less everywhere that I already put the light brown color. Now these colors are still wet so they're kind of blending together on the on the surface of the of the field. Well that's okay and what I did I took a pad of paper towels and used it like a blotter and went in and kind of blotted up the excess paint which tended to blend them together a little bit further. The last step was to go in and apply some of this darker brown color to the tops of the plants and you can see here all I'm doing is gently dragging the brush over the tops of the plants just to leave a little bit of paint right on the very tips. Now that I've kind of figured out what I want to do with the sugarcane and how to make some plants that look somewhat like sugarcane fields. I'm on the hunt for other kinds of model vegetation that I can use to simulate tropical foliage. What I'm really looking for are plants that make a good background to the sugarcane fields. Plants that look tropical, that are easy to find, easy to build, and look good on the railroad. I started by asking my friend Hal at AtlanticScaleModelers.com if he could laser cut me some leaves that looked like they came from one of the large tropical plants. Here's a sample he sent. These were laser cut just on green craft paper and they look pretty good. My next adventure was to go to the craft store and look at the dried flowers and the plastic flower reproductions that they had in stock. Most of what they had was a little too big for HO scale, but I did manage to salvage this one plant. I plan on painting it and then snipping off the individual leaf bundles. While building this project, I decided I needed some weeds that were a little different than the buffalo grass weeds. And so I tried making my own using a nylon scrubbing pad, and it worked pretty well, so I'm going to show you how I did it. What I did, I took Elmer's school glue. I like the school glue because it dries absolutely clear. It's transparent when it dries. So what I did, I put some drops of school glue on a piece of a plastic bag and ripped off 
some of this nylon scarring pad material. It's really tough stuff and you really have to pull and tug at it to get it to come off so that it looks like grass growing in kind of a random tuft. I put the tufts in the school glue and one of the big ones here kept falling over so I put a little weight behind it to hold it in place till the, till the glue dries. Once the glue is dry you pop it off the plastic and the weeds have their its own little stand and it allows it to sit flat on the scenery wherever you put it. I'm going to finish up this row and then I'm going to go away and allow the glue to dry and once the glue is dry I'm going to take the weeds to the paint booth to give them a nice green color. I'm going to use two shades of green and a shade of yellow. Here are a couple I made yesterday and you can see how nice they look. They're two-toned with green on the bottom and a little yellow on top. Here I'm planting some of the scrubbing pad weeds that I made and you can see they're on this nice little base. All you got to do is put down a little glue and push them in place and they look like a million bucks. Now I'm going to put them here and there. Any place I think I need tall grass or any place I want to cover up something. So I'm continuing to add things to this scene and what I want to do, I want to go away now and allow all the glue to dry. Here I'm just adding some weeds, some of the weeds that are like sugarcane plants, although I didn't paint them as well, and I'm adding them here just in front of the rocks, just into the wet matte medium. I'm going to add some super turf. I'm going to spray it again with matte medium so that everything's really wet and then I'm going to add some knock leaf foliage